Before we talk about what will be on your March primary ballot, we need to talk about one big thing that might not be. On Friday, a Cook County Circuit Court judge ruled that the Bring Chicago Home tax measure should be struck from the March primary ballot. We're going to talk more tomorrow's episode about what this means for the election and for the city's efforts to fund housing and services for people experiencing homelessness. All right, to more election news. Today on CityCast Chicago, let's be honest, we don't all recognize every single office on our ballots every election. Sure, it's easy when you start at the top. You got the president. Yeah, your representative. Sure. But clerks, commissioners, and committee people, uh, you know... These races are still important, so we've brought in Alex Nick in with the Illinois Answers Project to talk about some of these lesser-known races. It's Monday, February 26th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is What Chicago's Talking About. Alex, welcome back to CityCast. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm happy to be here. Now, we appreciate you being here. Let's start with an office that you've been covering. You literally just published a story on it. The Cook County Circuit Court Clerk. Uh, Alex, long title. What does this person do? Yeah, it's a mouthful. The CCCCC. Uh, Not to be confused (laughs) with the Cook County Clerk, which is, of course, completely different. The Cook County Circuit Court Clerk, um, currently a person named Iris Martinez, is basically the person in charge of keeping all of the court records. The office is about 100 and $60 million office, a huge part of the county court system whose responsibility is staffing all of the courts with clerks and through that responsible for maintaining all of the records, making sure that every time someone files a lawsuit, files a motion in court, a judge hands down an opinion, um, someone's criminal record is, is updated, that that is updated across the system and that everyone has access to it. Um, It's a really, it's not a very policy focused role. It's a very just Mm -hmm. like ministerial, managerial kind of role, which leads a lot of folks across the system to argue like it really shouldn't be an elected office. Like most courts across the country don't elect their clerks. Um, But We have also seen in the past, you know, 20 years or so, unfortunately, through a lot of really, uh, I'll say, sloppy management of this office, just how much it matters and how many people can be really impacted in very real ways. Right. It's always worth emphasizing there are a lot of relatively mundane things you might need to interact with the courts about. This is not all SVU, right? You divorce, traffic tickets, any kind of legal dispute. Um, And you bring up incumbent Iris Martinez, who's facing a pretty significant challenge in the Democratic primary from uh, Mariana Spiropoulos. That's right. Iris Martinez had been a state senator who in 2020 entered a pretty crowded primary race to succeed Um, Dorothy Brown, who was the previous clerk of the circuit court, who was legally embattled under multiple investigations, widely criticized for just honestly rank incompetence in in leadership of the office and all kinds of things going wrong. So Iris Martinez was uh, elected in 2020. Um, She really ran on a platform of kind of professionalizing the office, of cleaning everything up, of turning things around. The office, even at that point, had been on a long delay on a schedule to update its software to a new case management system that could launch all of these things online and sort of bring them into the 21st century. And she has been, uh, you know, at least she would argue she's really been successful in bringing those online, that what's called the Odyssey case management system fully came online and that transition completed in uh, 2023. Um, She has launched a customer service call center for people to um, call in and and sort of have their issues dealt with directly. She got the office out from under the thumb of a federal monitor from the, the Shackman lawsuit that had really been dogging the court clerk's office for, for years and years. She was able to kind of get, you know, show that they were doing professional hiring practices and get out of that. But still, um, even under Martinez's leadership, this office has been under a lot of criticism of, honestly, a lot of the same kinds of issues of just Mm -hmm. inaccurate records, people not being able to look up basic things and and just kind of errors and sloppiness all the way around, um, uh, issues with hiring and things like that, and just professionalism. 
Um, last year, WBEZ reported about um, this really serious issue whereby because of, um, you know, coding and data entry errors in the clerk's office, people who had completed probation programs that were supposed to result in their records getting wiped clean were still having convictions tied to their records and, you know, having serious impacts on their lives. Just another example of how this kinds of stuff really matters for, for real people. Right. That impacts your ability to secure housing, financial resources, uh, social services, and the list goes on and on. Absolutely. I mean, having that kind of scarlet letter or black mark on your record really can follow you for the rest of your life. And that also is really relevant to um, a, a new situation that I just reported at, at Illinois Answers Project on Friday um, about a situation where the clerk's office went live with a search portal um, about a month ago in late January to allow people to look up basic information, allow adults to look up basic information about their criminal cases that are pending. This is the kind of basic thing that's really available and come to be expected in most other jurisdictions and that mm -hmm. folks had really been hounding the office for, why don't you have this kind of thing yet? But apparently without realizing it, this portal also included access to youth records, to juvenile records, which is a huge no-no. It's against state law. Right. Under state law, under the Juvenile Court Act, um, any adjudication, criminal adjudication against a minor is not even supposed to count as a conviction, much less go on their permanent record in a way that can follow them. Because, you know, the idea is that any offense that you commit as a child, no matter how serious it is, should not be something that follows you for the rest of your life because you committed it when you were a child. Mm -hmm. It definitely shouldn't be easily searchable. Absolutely. And so it was up for uh, almost two weeks, this function. Um, thousands of uh, youth records were exposed through this site. And um, eventually a private attorney found this, freaked out, reached out to the Cook County Public Defender's Office. They freaked out, reached out to the clerk's office and says, oh, my God, you guys have violated state law and potentially exposed people's records. Their concern was that not necessarily even that people, individuals would go up and, and, and look at this, even though you have to, like, enter unique information for each youth defendant. But there are a lot of really, you know, elaborate and complex, like, data scrapers and third-party mm -hmm. websites that, in theory, could find this information and post it elsewhere. And then it's, you know, it's on the internet. You can't get it yeah. down. And so while the clerk's office has said they're confident that it's pretty unlikely that any of those records kind of made it out into the world, um, and we don't know of any instances of records getting out so far, it still really has been flagged as a, a really serious issue. And the public defender's office and the public defender himself, Sharon Mitchell, what he actually said was, we thought that this office had hit rock bottom in 2020. And somehow it's Ooh. gotten worse, um, which is a Ooh. really searing and striking thing to say, you know, when mm -hmm. this person faces reelection in less than a month. And I was going to say, you can't just keep blaming the, the previous administration. Eventually, the buck has to stop somewhere. And so when we think of the, the Democratic challenger, uh, Mariana Spiropoulos, who's been a commissioner for the Water Reclamation District, was dividing these candidates. Is, is Spiropoulos simply running on Martinez's 2020 platform of we need to professionalize the office, move it forward, clean up some of this uh, sloppiness? Honestly, that's a, in many ways, yes. And again, <laughs> when you're running for an office like this, the, there is not like a whole lot of new policies or directions you can go in. All you can really run on is like, I'm more competent than the person I'm running against. I can do mm -hmm. a better job at that mundane, nitty gritty stuff. I mean, one really interesting, actually, policy aspect of this is that Martinez campaigned in 2020 on um, helping to change the state law so that court records in Cook County would be subject to FOIA, Freedom of Information Act requests, which is a huge issue for us as journalists. Martinez had promised that she would be able to push a, through a state law to make that happen. Um, and then she eventually settled on a kind of compromise that, to all of us, was really watered down and not really effective at all. And now Sparopoulos is coming along and saying, no, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to manage okay. to get that law changed so that you can look things up through FOIA. Yeah, I mean, Spiropoulos doesn't really have much experience, just like Martinez didn't at the time that she was elected, in administration um, of big organizations. You know, Spiropoulos, she had been a, um, a, a private attorney, real estate attorney, um, and then since, I think, 2016 has been a commissioner on the Water Reclamation District um, of, of Greater Chicago. 
um, and has run for, you know, various higher offices in the past. And she's sort of independently wealthy and has had a lot of more money and resources and institutional support to throw into this campaign um, than Martinez has. And so now it's just a question of do enough people really know and care about it to make a real difference. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code P-O-D. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. I think this next race will will make at least a few people's ears perk up because it's about property taxes in some ways. Alice, can you remind us what is the Cook County Board of Review? The Cook County Board of Review is basically a kind of court of appeals where people can go and argue if they think that their property tax assessment is too high. And again, assessment, not the same thing as your property tax bill, but the assessment is something that the Cook County assessor, it is his job or people he works for to go around and decide for the purposes of taxation how much every single property in the whole county is worth. And that matters Mm -hmm. because it feeds into what share, what portion of the overall county tax burden you owe. And so Assessor Fritz Kagey came into office in 2018 on a real reform agenda of, you know, commercial property owners and office owners have been getting, you know, too uh, uh, cozy with the county. They've been getting good deals and getting breaks that are too big and the uh, to the detriment of everyone else. Basically, their properties are being assessed as being worth less. And so their property taxes are lower. That's right. And not only are their property taxes lower, but because of the way that it works, that means that necessarily like that burden spreads onto everyone else. It's like leaning on a balloon. The problem with that is that so Kagi comes in and starts um, changing the system using sort of different math and different methodologies. But people can still appeal that ruling from the assessor to this other body called the Cook County Board of Review, which is like a three member panel. It's this sort of they call it a quasi judicial body. It's like a court of appeals. You can go to them and say, hey, I don't think that the assessor got this right. I would like you to lower it for me because I think that my property is worth less than they think it does. And very often we've seen the Board of Review say, yeah, you know, you're right, because the Board of Review has sort of been operating under the same system that it has for years. And I think that no one represents um, the the kind of older, more traditional system of property tax assessments than Larry Rogers, who is the by far most senior member of the three-member Board of uh, Review. And uh, he and Kagi are just openly at war with each other. I was going to say that sounds like a like it is rife for contention. I am making these decisions on what something mm-hmm. is worth, how that will impact it. And then obviously you want those checks and balances. But if the appeals office is making drastically different rulings than then coming out of the assessor's office, you know, I, I, I imagine they're going to have have some words for each other. Absolutely. And uh, it's actually gotten really nasty and personal over the last couple of years, in particular mm-hmm. between Kagi and Rogers in particular, where Rogers has looked at a lot of the things. I ain't think we was going to get no beef in this conversation like this. Oh, yeah. The assessor's <laughs> office and the board of review's office is like real, um, especially with, with these two guys. Rogers has really been taking Kagi to task over issues with delays in the system that have been uh, wrought by both updates in their technology and also um, this decision that Kagi made to basically redo assessments halfway through 2020 to take into account the effect of COVID, but it ended up being a total disaster. Um, So Rogers basically says Kagi's incompetent. Kagi looks back at Rogers and says uh, he's corrupt. I mean, he calls him corrupt in no uncertain terms. Mostly he's looking at... um, a very real and out in the open phenomenon of Rogers' campaigns, um, term after term, really being funded by property tax attorneys and by mm-hmm. by donations from the same people who are having their cases adjudicated by the Board of Review. Rogers, who, by the way, is also a trial lawyer and separately from his job at the Board of Review, the president of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association, um, just gets tons of donations from property tax attorneys who practice before the Board of Review. While these two guys openly paid each other, 
Um, the, they've never really, you know, the assessor's office has been very careful not to get involved in board of review races in the past. And Kagi has explicitly said like, that would not be appropriate. Um, you know, we're sort of a government check and balance against each other. It wouldn't be right for me to put my thumb on the scale. But he's, he's now got an endorsement. He's now endorsing somebody. This term, that is out <laughs> the window. Kagi's like, screw it. I'm putting all of my money and backing behind this challenger to Larry Rogers. Um, named Larisha Tucker. Larisha Tucker, is, she's relatively unknown. She's a local township assessor, um, you know, lifelong resident of the South Suburbs. And her campaign, her challenge against Rogers is almost entirely being uh, um, funded by Kagi himself. Kagi, who is like independently wealthy. And so it, it, it's really become this sort of proxy battle between the two of them. And there are huge implications for the Board of Review because... Two years ago, Samantha Steele, who is sort of a, a challenger insurgent in more of in the Kagi camp of things, um, was elected to the Board of Review. And also George Cardenas, the former Chicago alderman, who's been sort of a, a wild card in this. But really, a three-member Board of Review has been kind of a battle back and forth between Larry Rogers and Samantha Steele. I mean, we just saw that on the decision over how the um, Bears property in Arlington Heights should get valued. It was a two to one vote where Larry Rogers and George Cardenas said, let's give them a break. And Samantha Steele said, no, we should have them, their assessment be higher. And so if Tucker takes over or if Tucker defeats and unseats Larry Rogers, this really would represent kind of a, a coup, if you want to call it that, at the Board of Review. It would finally be, you know, allies of Fritz Kagi taking over that board. How does Kagi? kind of center in the public, the idea of calling Rogers corrupt and now is essentially trying to buy a board of review seat. I mean, La Tucker has come out and said, you know, she would be independent of Kagi if elected for the record. But again, you're, you're being funded by the person that does not. That of course, that is not a one to one that you will work for them. But that, that that's you know, he wants a better relationship uh, with this office. And so, you know, uh, how how is that playing in, into the situation? It's a really good point. And I think that that feeds into exactly how these two guys are talking about this race of um, KG saying, well, if this guy's corrupt, we have to get him out of here at whatever cost. And Larisha Tucker is, you know, a good candidate and I trust her and she'll be independent. And then Larry Rogers saying back, um, you know, this is this is basically just like a, a, a puppet of Fritz Kagi who he's trying to install. And how can you say that I am beholden to all of these property tax attorneys and private interests um, when the donations are are coming really just from essentially one person on the other side of it. So it's a very ugly race. It's a very messy race. Um, but I would argue a very, very important race um, for the future of property tax policy um, in Cook County. We do have one more race uh, that we wanted to talk about. So what does a ward committee person actually do? This is something that people are going to be going to the ballot to, to vote for. It's something that it doesn't have quite the same mystique as it maybe did a couple decades ago. The ward committeeman was like the boss of the ward, even more powerful than the alderman, because everything was done through the Cook County Democratic Party. And now, in terms of how much power it has, the Cook County Democratic Party is really a, a shadow of its former self, but it does wield influence in a lot of ways. The ward-level committee person is one of 80 that sort of represent the entire, you know, central committee of the Cook County Democratic Party. It's 50 wards in 30 suburban townships. And each committee person, I would say, really has... I would break it down into three roles, three categories. The first is... They have a little, they're part of that central voting committee that um, votes on who the Cook County Democratic Party endorses. The second thing is that it often just gives you access to some local um, resources to a political action committee. Mm -hmm. There's some organizing infrastructure and some money that just comes with that position. And so that's a reason also why a lot of independent folks and other candidates have been kind of foregoing this position altogether and saying, well, we can build our own networks, we can build our own institutions. And so you're seeing a lot of what's called IPOs, independent political organizations, um, sprout up and, and sort of rivaling those. The third, I would argue probably most important or most powerful function of committee people is that they get to fill legislative vacancies. And we've seen this come into play in a lot of really key 
ways and instances, and, and this happens all the time where a um, county commissioner, a state senator, a state rep will will step down halfway through their term, sometimes because they're elected mayor, sometimes because for whatever reason. And under state law, the way that that um, position gets filled midterm is that the party committee people whose wards or townships overlap with that legislative district all get together in a room and they decide who is going to finish out that term. And whoever's ward overlaps the most with their that district is going to get a greater share of the vote. And we've seen this play out in, in a lot of, of ways. It's, it's, it's really important. We've seen this, you know, committee people be really key to a lot of these appointments, including in the 33rd ward on the northwest side of Chicago, um, I think is a really vivid example of, of the power of this position with our, our friend Iris Martinez. The last time the ward committee person race was up, um, Iris Martinez ran and um, the alderwoman, Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, who had just been elected alder person, um, opted not to run. And since then, we've seen Martinez actually like flex a lot of power through that position um, in terms of you know, embracing and networking with the fraternal order of police and some more conservative elements of the political system, and also um, filling some key legislative vacancies. And now um, Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez is, is running for Democratic committee person. I think it's a pretty good example of, you know, she has co- clearly come to understand the power of this position, although it's still kind of obscure, it's pretty limited, but it's, it's very real and it's something everyone's going to be voting on. In the city, at least. It's not really a governing office, right? It's more of a party office fundamentally, which means there are Republican committee people. And this year, for the first time, there'll be a few Libertarian committee people as well. Is it realistic for the average Chicagoan to keep track of of what all these people do all year round? Like, you know, how realistic is that we stay tapped in when it feels like, you know, there's an election every year, every every it feels like every few months I'm being asked to vote on something? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of I'm maybe not the right person to ask about this because I honestly think that all of these things are like really exciting and fun, fun to follow and certainly like more fun than like national politics, which seems like more of the same old all the time. But honestly, it's just when you when you get your ballot, especially if you're going to vote by mail and at home like I do. And if you're just going to take a minute to look up these names, a little bit of Googling and you could find some real coverage that's being done of these races. They're real voter guides. I want to shout out the Injustice Watch Judicial Voter Guide is a really key resource. So voter guides like, you know, Girl I Guess or like the various different, you know, unions and political factions have their own sort of like palm cards of who they want you voting for. Um, It's not like you have to necessarily stay engaged on every single thing that every one of these offices does during the terms but I think it's a pretty reasonable ask to just, you know, do a little bit of research before you go into the voting booth and understand some of the main dynamics that are at play here and what's at stake. I want to give another thank you to the government finance and accountability reporter with the Illinois Answers Project from the Better Government Association, Alex Nicken. Thank you for making time, Alex. Thanks so much for having me. Before I let you go, for more news and events and the latest tax season tips, head over to our website, chicago.citycast.fm. And while you're there, to get all of these things in your inbox every morning, Monday through Friday, subscribe to our Hey Chicago newsletter. Of course, I got some good news. Free Museum Days are a great way to get around the city, and this week there are free days available at the Field Museum, the Shed Aquarium, the Adler Planetarium, the Art Institute, MCA Du Sable, and so many more. You can check the show notes for a link and make sure you have your state ID when you go. As always, we appreciate you for listening and reading. We're going to be back bright and early tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Peace.